And that's what happens in the schools. Now in Indiana, we have uh, a, we may have a progressive disciplinary system where it starts with suspension and then uh, of course what happens? We put a kid out of school and give him or her what to do? Nothing. Nothing. So now we have a kid who misbehaved in school, maybe out of anger, maybe because of something else that was going on in the family, and we have that young person out on his or her own for 10 days while the parent or guardian is probably out of the home at work um, doing their own business, and we have an unattended young person who's going to do what? Mm, you know, I know what I would have done when I was a kid. I would have run the streets. Um, <laughs> And uh, then if that young person continues with that typical, typically typical adolescent misbehavior, we may go to an expulsion hearing. And, and raise your hand if you know the unique distinction Indiana has around expulsion hearings. Hmm. Indiana is the only state where statutorily you are not, not entitled to an advocate or counsel during your expulsion hearing. Unless the superintendent says, okay, you can bring an advocate or an attorney with you to your expulsion hearing. So um, Indiana, let me just give you another little stat here. Since in the post-Columbine era, Indiana has another distinction. We've traditionally led the nation in the highest proportion of black students uh, who are suspended per 100 students in the school, over 20 black students per 100 have been suspended every year in the post-Columbine era in Indiana. That's what started, if some of you may be uh, familiar with the, with the work that Russ Skiba at the Keep Center at Indiana University in Bloomington has done, uh, extensive work on the school to prison pipeline. It actually began with an investigation of the numbers of young people who are expelled and suspended um, in Indiana. Now, if you're not going the school route, but you've been uh, arrested and referred by your school resource officer or by outside law enforcement being called in, then you'll face a probation officer whose job it is to petition or not petition you based on the severity of your uh, crime delinquent activity within school rather than just process you like I mean, when I went to school it was the assistant principal everybody feared this guy and uh, and if you were called into the assistant principal it was going to be a big deal you know I can speak from personal experience at least in the middle on the junior <laughs> high school level um, um, if you if the probation officer makes a decision to file a petition, a delinquency petition, then you're referred through the juvenile court process. Um, if not, you may just be dismissed or you may go through what we call in Indiana informal, uh, which means if you behave yourself, the probation officer will keep an eye on you for X number of weeks or months. If you behave yourself, don't get in trouble again. There won't be a charge filed or a petition uh, filed. Uh, but if you go the petition route, then you uh, may wind up in detention, which is our county-run, short-term uh, uh, kind of uh, incarceration facility. Keep in mind, Indiana, uh, detention and incarceration are two different things. Kids go to detention um, the way an adult would go to a jail or lockup if the adult couldn't make bail or bond, but there's no bail or bond for juveniles, remember that, and there's no trial by jury for juveniles either. If your uh, petition goes through, you may be detained, you may be sent home, you may be placed on electronic monitoring, and the prosecutor decides whether to move that charge forward, in which case you would be before the juvenile judge or the juvenile magistrate here in Marion County, and there are a number of options for the judge or magistrate uh, to choose from. Um, that's why we call it the school to prison pipeline, because it's typically typical adolescent behavior resulting in law enforcement presence in the school grabbing you moving you up the law the chain to the probation officers and by the way ips has probation officers in many of its schools i don't know if all of its schools 
In addition to which, IPS has uh, mental health counselors from one of the community mental health agencies in many of its schools as well. So the schools have become a, a substitute for what should have be, be happening in the community. And so that's the process. And if by some chance you're unfortunate enough to have your um, charge be considered so severe, you may wind up um, in the Department of Correction Division of Youth Services, which runs four boys' facilities and one girl's facility throughout the state. Um, and uh, let's take yesterday's example of the gang prosecutor who, uh, because those four 11 to 14-year-old girls who were in a fight with a 15-year-old girl were using gang language during the fight, 11 years old, okay, using gang language. I mean, I can remember what we used to say when we were fighting, when we were kids. <laughs> right? They're using gang language. They not only face uh, assault charges, but criminal gang intimidation charges and other gang-related activity for 11 and to 14-year-old girls. And over on what, Washington and East, I think it happened, um, in a fight with a 15-year-old girl, the 15-year-old girl chose to meet the, the other girl at the corner based on a conversation they were having uh, on uh, some social media, uh, my first question was, where the hell were the parents? <laughs> Bill, not to cut you off, but we only have a couple of more minutes left, and I would like to have, um, offer the audience a chance to answer or to ask a question of the panel. So if anyone has a question, please raise your hand, and if you could go, uh, she'll bring the microphone to you. I think someone over there. I'm sorry, I have a terrible memory for names, but and, and I can't quite read yours, but the, the gentleman who's uh, working in the schools and so on. Oh, Mr. Tenenbaugh. Yes. Has, mm -hmm. has IPS in the elementary level done anything to flood these schools with images of, from African-American history and pick, pick pictures of Frederick Douglass or Harriet Tubman or other, you know, there are plenty of people that they could pick to try to show images in the hallways and so on to try to motivate kids a little bit more or to give kids a more positive history or sense of themselves. Well, I can definitely attest to at my school, School 56, over on uh, 23rd and uh, North Columbia Avenue. Uh, our principal uh, makes sure that every month they uh, uh, advertise another culture. Like this month, they're doing the Hispanic thing. You know, they got stuff all over the walls about different in, in book in cases, glass cases on the walls on the bulletin boards outside in the hall, and some have them in the classroom uh, promoting the uh, Hispanic, Mexican, and uh, Spanish culture and stuff, you know. And um, they had, you know, during other parts of the year, like they had some on the African Americans, they, not just in February, but, you know, throughout the year. Yes, this picking up steam is pretty, for the most part, pretty new. You know, but it's picking up sting, like I said earlier, you know, as a result of Dr. White and, and Dr. Pat Payne uh, collaborating on this culture infusion um, concept and mandating all the schools uh, participate in this cultural thing. I think we have another quick cultural question diversity. over here. Who, who are the corporations making money off of these private prisons and institutions? And what kind of money are we talking about? Well, in Indiana, we have uh, um, uh, private contractors that provide medical services um, that actually probably is more cost effective than the state doing it itself. We don't have the privatization that other states have had. All the, as far as I know, all of our correctional institutions are still run by the Department of Correction directly, uh, but. The budget's huge. It's, I don't know, $500 million a year, I think. It costs well, cost $71,900 a year to incarcerate a young person in Indiana. $71,900 a year, right? I, I've, I've done some work. I've, I've typically said to people, I could send a kid to Harvard and rent him a car 
for that much money, right? Um, how much is that? It's like nine to ten times what the average per pupil expenditure is in public school. So, you know, balance that out. It doesn't matter whether it's privatized or not. It's still just imbalanced. I think we have uh, one question up here. Thank you. Um, thank you. There is um, many of our children in, our, in, in the uh, urban schools, schools in the inner city, um, are taunted by administration and teachers. I'll give you an example. My son told me he felt like a bull in a bullfight. He felt like, um, Mom, um, I feel like there's a matador with a red cape and they're taunting me. Um, he told me this because at that point he had said, he made a statement to the administrators, I feel like I'm being, I feel like you're racist. He's 14 year olds, he's trying to relate to them how you're treating me. Um, he's saying these things. At that point, I had the administrator tells him, if you don't sit down, I'm going to call the police on you. These kinds of things, um, I understand people say it is, um, that the, you have to have um, um, the, the, the it, it's, it's not just on the side of the child. People, these children are being taunted, many of them by teachers and administration. Those things have to change as well. It's not just one-sided, it's not just the parent and the child. It's also the, what's going on in the school. It's also what's going on with the teacher. It's also going on with the administrator. That's what's going on there. What's being done there? You know, and I hear all the time they need the, um, what's it called, the, uh, uh, where they talk about uh, being fair and all that kind of stuff. Not mediation, it's called when, um, I forget what it's called, but it's kind of like diversity training or something. 